second. All right, thanks you all for coming to the week two review session. We are gonna cover a lot of things tonight and we only have about an hour so, and we're not gonna go too deep into things. I can stay a little bit late if you do have questions and wanna hang around afterwards. Um, so please don't feel shy or embarrassed to ask any questions if you have them. And you can always come off of mute and verbalize your question or put it in the chat. You can, of course, private chat me as well if you don't want people to see who's asking the question. But this is a learning friendly environment. So please, please don't be shy. All right. So one of the hardest parts of this exam is keeping all of the terminology straight. And that's not surprising because like transcription and translation sound very similar. So does transformation and transduction, right? So on an exam, if you read too fast or you even just doubt yourself a little bit, it's easy to get these concepts confused. So what I like to do in my in-class exam reviews is I have this word bank that you see in front of you. And I have my students uh, get a piece of paper that's blank and I draw it in or divide it into four sections. So I'm gonna go ahead and move my mine over here. Let's see if it's gonna cooperate. Why is it not showing y'all? Okay, hold on. It's a Blackboard update. I'm not a fan for being honest. Here we go. There it is. Okay, so here's my quote unquote piece of paper. And so I'm gonna have my word bank off to the side on another screen. So give me one second. Okay, so what I want you to do, and if you don't have time or you don't just have a paper, a piece of paper next to you, you can open up the week two handout and just write next to it which uh, topic that word belongs to. So for instance, when you see the first word on the list, codon, is the word codon associated with DNA replication, transcription, translation, or horizontal gene transfer? And so you're gonna just, if you divide the, your paper into sections, you're just gonna literally say, oh, I think codon goes here, right? Or whichever section you think it goes into. Or like I said, if you don't wanna do that, you can just write down next to the word codon, which process that term is associated with. Okay, so go ahead and I'm going to give you just two minutes for you to look at this word list and put each word into one of these squares that you see. Now, even if you don't know, and here I'm going to give you a test taking strategy or a study strategy. Even if you don't know, put it somewhere. And here's why. If you're wrong, you're probably going to remember that later. Okay, we, our brain actually holds on to things when we're wrong. And so being wrong is actually a good thing when you're studying and when you're learning, okay? Because we're going to correct it so you'll remember come exam time. So I don't recommend just sitting there staring at the screen for two minutes. Actively try to remember which process each of these terms are associated with, okay? All right, I am going to stop talking now for two minutes. Um, where is the list of words? It's on the week two review session handout that is in the weekly review session folder. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to see why Blackboard won't share everything on my screen. Come on, Blackboard, let's do this. Here we go. So I'm going to have the word list up. There we go.
All right, take about just 20 more seconds to just do your best to put each of these words into one of these boxes. And then we are gonna go through it together. All right, so in the chat, um, go ahead and kind of get ready to type which or concept you think each word is associated with. And if you want to, just to save us a little time, because um, we do have a lot to get through, I'm going to use some of my abbreviations. And if you want to use them in the chat when answering, feel free. So like for DNA replication, just type in the chat like DNA or TX or just it can be an abbreviation even if it's your own so I know some of these words are long all right so y'all which process is the word codon associated with is it DNA and go ahead and just push enter once you type something is it DNA replication transcription translation or horizontal gene transfer This one is actually going to be translation, okay? Because remember, in, the, in this case, y'all, I would write down a little blurb of what each one is. Because remember, a codon is a set of three RNA nucleotides, right, that dictate which amino acid needs to be brought to the ribosome, okay? So remember, that's what translation is all about, right? It, the goal of translation is to make proteins. And so the cell needs to know, well, which amino acids do I need? What order do I need them in? And so a codon is a set of three nucleotides found on the messenger RNA that says, hey, I need methionine first. Okay, now I need proline. Now I need threonine. Okay, so a codon is what's found on a piece of messenger RNA that dictates which amino acid comes next. All right, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna work my way down this list. What about DNA polymerase three? Where does DNA polymerase three go? Yes, good. And remember DNA polymerase three, that is the main key player, right? This is the one that's building that new strand of DNA nucleotides. Good. All right. Anticodon. Hint, it sounds like the one we've already done. Yes, good. So y'all, what does anti mean? When you see that prefix anti, what does that mean? Against or opposite? But yeah, you're right. Against is, is valid. Opposite is kind of what I'm going with because notice my definitions right now, they're the same, right? They're both a set of three nucleotides. So what's different? Where they're found? So remember, an anticodon is on a transfer RNA, whereas our codons are on the messenger RNA. And we're going to review this in part two of this handout. All right, but they're both a set of three RNA nucleotides. It's just a matter um, of which type of RNA that you find it on. All right, polypeptide chain. What is that? Here I thought I like spiced up the order here, but I really didn't need to. Wait, yes, so a polypeptide chain is just a chain of amino acids. That's what we're making dur during translation. And this is actually, so it's a chain of amino acids. So it's just not folded. In order for something to be a protein, it has to be folded into a specific shape. So during translation, when it's just literally attaching one amino acid to the next, it's not folded, it can't do anything. It's just a chain of amino acids. We technically call that a polypeptide. 
All right, now we're gonna start getting away from translation. Origin of replication, which process is that associated with? I'm clicking on the wrong window here. That's good, DNA replication. So you find the origin of replication on a piece of DNA. That's what tells the cell, hey, or actually it tells like helicase and all those key players, hey, come right here and start separating this DNA molecule. We need to make a copy of it. So I abbreviated it OOR just to save me some time. So good, origin of replication is where DNA replication starts. Remember, this happens wherever the DNA is in the cell. So for our eukaryotes, all the DNA is in the nucleus, but for our prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus, right? So their, um, their uh, DNA is in the cytosol. It's, remember, it's suspended by that jelly-like fluid. So that's, or the cytoplasm, um, because technically it's just, it's still in that space. So either one, you would never see both of those as answer choices on an exam. Um, but just remember that prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. All right, transformation, where does that go? Excellent, good job, y'all. Okay, good. So transformation is a type of horizontal gene transfer. Remember, that's how bacteria acquire DNA that's not their own, right? Bacteria, they do asexual reproduction. It's literally a copy and paste mechanism, okay? We have one cell, it copies its DNA. So now there's two pieces of DNA and then it splits off into two cells. So each cell has a piece of DNA. It's copy and paste. There's no spicing things up. So there are ways for bacteria to get DNA that's not their own to kind of spice things up. So remember, transformation is when the DNA comes from the environment, okay? And we're gonna come back and talk about this more as we go through this list. So they get DNA from the environment. All right, anti-parallel, where do you think that goes? What did we talk about that's anti-parallel? Good, yeah, DNA, because when we talk about DNA in general, remember there are two things you have to remember. It's anti-parallel. I'm gonna go ahead and add another term as well. Why did I put it in transcription, sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you, Preeti, I appreciate that. I just got all carried away. All right, so remember for DNA and for all nucleic acids, really, they're anti-parallel, which means the strands run in opposite directions. And I added complementary. I don't think that's on the list anywhere, but it's worth remembering. And remember, complementary, that just means the base pairing. So remember, A pairs with T, G pairs with C. And we're going to put these ideas into action in part two. Okay, so if you're sitting there and you're like, what the heck are you talking about? Feel free to ask, but a lot of this we're going to keep building on in part two, just trying to get your brains warmed up. All right, RNA polymerase. Where do we put RNA polymerase? Yes, good job. Okay. Now, on your exams, I don't abbreviate. Like, I won't put RPOL. I put RNA polymerase. I know sometimes, like, when I'm doing the videos and stuff, I do abbreviate. So RNA polymerase is the key player for transcription. So one thing that I really recommend y'all do is know what transcription is, right? This is the DNA to RNA. Let's see if I can quickly get a, an arrow in here without eating up a lot of time. So remember, we start with a piece of DNA and we use that to make a piece of RNA. So another way of saying transcription is to say RNA synthesis. That's our goal, right? To make RNA. Let's try to spread all this out. Come on, you can do it. You can fit. There we go. Okay, because on an exam, like I was saying um, right at seven o'clock, 
the hardest, one of the hardest parts of this exam is so many words sound so similar, right? Transcription, translation, transformation, transduction. It's so easy, especially if you have test anxiety to be like, what are we talking about here, right? So anytime you see transcription, your mind needs to go, boom, making RNA, RNA synthesis. We start with DNA, we make RNA. And if you remember that, then you'll know that the key player is RNA polymerase. Because remember, y'all, whenever you see a word like this, okay, if it ends in ASE, that just means it's an enzyme. So you can ignore the ASE. And what do you have then? RNA polymer. So this enzyme makes RNA. Okay, well, what process makes RNA? transcription boom they must be linked okay so that's kind of how you have to approach all of these words all right conjugation where does that go good horizontal gene transfer and which cell structure is um, associated with conjugation was on your week one activity Venn diagram. Which structure is associated with conjugation? The pillus. That's over here on the, uh, on the word list. So we're going to go ahead and cross that one off. So remember, the pillus is built. The cell creates it. It's almost like going fishing. It'll, when the bacteria detects another bacteria nearby, it extends out the pillus like it's casting a fishing line. When the pillus attaches to the other cell, they reel it back in to bring it close by. Okay, so think of a pillus like a fishing line. And then once they're close by, the one cell can copy and share its plasmid. Okay, so with conjugation, you want to remember the structure pillus, but you also want to remember the F plasmid. That's what gets shared between the two bacteria. So at the end of the day, both bacteria can now create a, um, a pillus. All right, tRNA is our next word. Where does tRNA go? tRNA is gonna be with translation. Oh, I'm in the wrong file. So tRNA is associated with translation. What does that T stand for? Transfer, good, so remember that. It's a transfer RNA, which means it has to be transferring something. What does a transfer RNA actually transfer? What does it pick up and deliver to the ribosome? What are we trying to connect together to build a protein? There we go. It's going to transfer amino acids. Because remember, y'all, we're going to kind of do what we did with the transcription one real quick. When you hear translation, and I'm not going to have enough space, but that's okay. When you hear translation, your brain needs to go protein synthesis. We are making proteins. And to do that, we need amino acids. Right? Amino acids are what proteins are made out of. So we need something in the cell to go grab all the amino acids needed and bring them to the ribosome. Okay, And that's what the transfer RNA does. They're like the little, little gophers that go and grab the amino acids that we need, bring them to the ribosome. All right, replication fork, where does that go? Good. That's the DNA replication one. All right, bacteriophage. Where does that go? Good. What's the, what is the type of horizontal gene transfer that uses a bacteriophage? It's one of the words on this list.
Good, Megan, yes, transduction. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that just to keep all of my, my list together. So transduction is the third and final type of horizontal gene transfer. This is when a bacteria gets extra DNA because it's infected with a bacteriophage. Remember a bacteriophage is a virus that only infects bacteria. Remember, bacteria carry genetic material. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Viruses and bacteriophage carry genetic material. And sometimes when the bacteriophage are replicating, they get all confused and they grab hold of bacterial DNA rather than viral DNA. So when this virus, right, doesn't have a brain, it doesn't know any better, when it goes and does its virus job of infecting a new host, it delivers bacterial DNA to the bacteria. The bacteria is like, well, hey, hey, thanks a lot. And sometimes it gets an advantage. And when we get to unit four, the diseases, some really scary diseases um, are carried by bacteria that are infected with a bacteriophage. So transduction is the reason we have like diphtheria, which is like a deadly, deadly disease. So this idea of transduction is gonna come back up later in the class. So here's our three types of horizontal gene transfer. All right, uh, last one in column one, competent cells. Where do competent cells come into play here? It's like Megan was ready for me. Exactly. So this is with transformation, okay? And so there's DNA sometimes floating around in the environment, normally because a neighboring cell has died. And when that neighboring bacteria has died, sometimes they explode, right? We've talked about how bacteria can lice. Well, that means DNA and all the quote unquote guts of the bacteria are just chilling in the environment. And some cells are like, well, hey, hey, what's this? Can I use any of this DNA? And they'll take it up from the environment. Now, it's very hard to do. This is not very common because DNA, even chunks of DNA, are pretty large compared to a bacterial cell. And DNA is also charged. I'm not sure if you covered that level of detail in your prerequisite course, but there is a negative charge associated with DNA. So as you all know, the plasma membrane, right, it regulates what goes in and out of cells. It doesn't like to take big charged things into the cell. So a lot of cells cannot do transformation. Only certain cells, competent cells, do have mechanisms in place that let them take large charged things into the cell. And so we call them competent because they are able to do so. We actually use transformation a lot in research labs. We can essentially force bacteria like E. coli to take in pieces of, of DNA so that we can study certain proteins and what they do. All right, so these are your three types of horizontal gene transfer. You need to know their names and the gist of what they do. Okay, because I know there's just a lot in this unit. So big picture understanding of what each of these are. All right, let's see. We've covered some of these in the second column already. All right, primer. Where does a primer come into play in this unit? Good, DNA replication. So what I'm gonna recommend you do, just take 15 seconds from memory. In this DNA replication section, write down as many of the key players as you can think of. There's a couple in that second column, but there's seven that you need to know for your exam. And consider this a huge wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You have to know what these seven key players do. I only have, I think, two of them in this list, but go ahead, take a few seconds and write down as many as you can remember. All right, so I'm going to write the key player that creates the primer, which is the word in this list. And that is our key player known as primase. Remember, there are seven key players in DNA replication. Primase is one of them. 
and it lays down an RNA primer, which allows DPO3 to do its job of building that new strand of DNA. And then we've covered the next two terms. So that brings us to our another key player, topo isomerase. So I'm just gonna put him in DNA replication because that's where he belongs. Does anybody remember what topo isomerase does? Good, it relieves supercoiling. So yes, it uncoils the supercoiling, good. Because if the DNA gets too wound up during this process, it can break, it becomes brittle. We can't have that, right? Nothing is gonna be able to survive with broken DNA. So topor isomerase is critical for DNA replication. All right, can somebody give me some more of the key players, whether they're on this list or not? There we go, Andrew. It's almost like you know what I was gonna ask. We've got helicase, good. We've got ligase, good. We've got the other DNA polymerase. I'm gonna put dipole one. Let's see, so that gives us one, two, three, four, five, six. Good, Jessica. Those single-stranded binding proteins, SSBPs. That is the one abbreviation I do put on your exams. Uh, just because it, it takes up like the whole space if I spell it out. So SSBP are those single stranded binding proteins. Good job, y'all. All right. Oh, we're already at 7.30. Time flies. Okay. So where did I leave off? We've gotten transformation. So for summaries. Promoter. Oh, this is a good one. The promoter. Where does that go? That's transcription. This is the start site. Oops, I'm not spelling properly. This is the start site of transcription. So this is on a piece of DNA, right? Because we're starting with DNA. The goal is to make RNA. Well, if the promoter is the start site of transcription, then this has to be on DNA, right? Because that's what we're starting with. So it's a little DNA sequence that RNA polymerase will bind to so that it can then start making RNA. All right, A, T, G, and C are used. So when do we need to be incorporating A, T's, G's, and C's? Good, DNA replication. What gives it away? What letter there is unique to DNA? Good, the thymine, that's gonna come back soon. All right, wonderful. Okazaki fragments, where do we find those? Yeah, DNA replication has a lot of stuff, doesn't it? Oh, I'm not gonna type DNA replication. What do I need? Okazaki fragment. Good, good, good. All right, we did ligase already. Ribosome, where is the ribosome? a key player. Yes, remember y'all, ribosomes are our protein making machines, right? So which process is making proteins? Translation. Good, all right, AUGC, where are AUs, Gs, and Cs used? Good, transcription. So remember, if you see a uracil, the U, you know you're dealing with RNA, okay? So RNA does not have T. All right, AUG, where is this a start site? Good, what is AUG? What do we call that? Good, Hallie, good. Start codon. Good. It codes for a methionine, um, specifically a special methionine, the one that comes first. So it's called the FMET. Yep, good job. I don't even know if I went to that level of detail in my videos. Cool, good. So it is the start. So actually, uh, Nicole, I love that you, you put that or statement there because AUG 
is the start codon, right? Because we already said a codon is a set of three RNA nucleotides, the A, the U, and the G. But the methionine, that's the amino acid that AUG codes for, okay? So methionine is not the start codon. It's what the start codon codes for, okay? So I love how you worded that. You worded that very carefully, and I like that. Okay, so just make sure you realize methionine is the amino acid, AUG is the codon. All right, I think we're just about done. Semi-conservative, where does that come into play? Excellent, good. Remember, DNA replication is a semi-conservative process. Good job. Any questions on these, y'all? The hard part with like a review session is I just want to go in and like teach all the things again. I'm like, no, they have the videos. All right, good. Can somebody answer this? What does helicase do? And there's a couple different ways we can word it. And I want to blow this up. And so I want to see if somebody will type it for me real quick to give me a second to make this larger. Let's see, did that help? Eh, maybe. All right, good. Okay. So let's start with this helicase question real quick. So remember I mentioned when you're looking at the word, ignore that ASE, right? That just tells us it's an enzyme. So I'm going to delete it for a second. What's in front of that ASE gives you a hint as to what it does. So helix sounds like helix, right? Like a DNA helix. So helicase's goal, remember, and I, I'm sorry, I can't really, we're going to have to pretend my DNA is going this way. Um, it's double-stranded, right? And so we have to separate those strands. And so helicase is the one that separates those two strands of nucleotides. So helicase actually gets the DNA replication party started by separating those two strands of nucleotides. Good question. All right, dipole 1 and dipole 3, they are very similar in that they can both lay down nucleotides. They can build a strand of nucleotides. But remember, I think of it as dipole one is the big sister to dipole three. I think of dipole three as the baby of the family, the third born. And so remember, dipole three has some limitations. One being that it cannot start from scratch. It can't just get up and start building DNA. That's why primase was used, right? Primase lays down that RNA primer. Dipole three attaches to it, and then he builds that strand of DNA. Remember this? And so there's a problem there, though, because we can't have that RNA mixed in with our DNA. That's problematic because they're two different things. So dipole 1, being the big sister, is going to come in and clean up this mess. So dipole 1 has two really important jobs. One is to remove that RNA primer. We can't have it. But by removing that primer, now there's a gap, right? There's this, these nucleotides that are missing. Well, we can't have that either. So her second job is to fill in that gap, lay down DNA nucleotides to complete that strand. Good questions, y'all. Anything else? <coughs> Excuse me. If not, Preeti, hang, hang around once we're done and I can kind of sketch it real quick. All right, y'all, let's move on to part two. Yes. Oh, wait. Uh, yes and no. Let me come back to this. Yeah, let me come back to this at the end. All right. So, y'all, number two is going to kind of be applying some of those terms that we did. And you've seen this in your knowledge checks, not quite as long because um, you don't have much time on the knowledge checks. But what I want you to do is go ahead and write in the answers to these to the best of your ability. But we are going to do them together just to save time. But I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to try to answer each one okay, as we go along. All right, so I give you a strand of DNA. First off, if I just showed you this and I said, hey, what kind of molecule is this? 
you would tell me that it's DNA, right? Because it has thymines in it, okay? So we know it's DNA. We said that DNA is anti-parallel and complementary, right? So when I give you the directionality and sequence of one strand of DNA, you should be able to give me the other strand. That's what I want you to do. What would that second strand of nucleotides be for the piece of DNA? Yeah, I'm going to try it. So y'all do that while I try to get like a, a text box going. You're going to want to know how to do this for your exam. So please make sure you're actively trying. I wonder if it's going to be easier for me to just write on this. We're about to find out. Oops. Get that out of the way. There we go. This is why technology is great when it actually cooperates. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and try and type and read this at the same time. So remember, <clears throat> the, the second strand of nucleotides has to be anti-parallel. That means opposite direction. So because the strand I gave you starts with three prime, the opposite is going to be five prime. Okay, so that's going to start my second strand. I'm going to do my best, like I said, to read and type at the same time. So here we go. We have T on the original strand. So that's going to pair with A. That second A is going to pair with T. Remember, base pairing here. Okay, now here's where I'm just going to read the new strand. So I have A, T, G, C, T, A, A, G, T, C, C, T, G, T, C, A, T, C, T, A, A, three prime. Hope I didn't butcher that. Does everybody, do y'all see how I got this? The directionality is opposite of what's up here. And I just went one base at a time and wrote its partner. T always pairs with A. So therefore, A always pairs with T. The third one was a C. It always pairs with G. Are we okay with this? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So there's no scratch paper of any kind on the exam, so you won't have anything near this long. Not at all. <laughs> yes, the code on wheel. Oh, no, please don't memorize it. Oh, that would be a nightmare. I will give you everything you need. That's a great question. I forgot to mention that in the announcement. I will mention that tomorrow. Nope, the code on wheel is provided. All right, so the next question is, what would be the RNA made after transcription? Okay, so here's where people tend to make life a little harder than they probably need to. Give me a second to move things around. Come on, word, you can do it. Oh, no, it's going to freeze on me. Please, no. Boop. Ooh. Okay, all right, it's back, it's back. Here we go. Okay, now this is not the answer. Give me just one second though. I'm just trying to not let my computer have a spaz attack. There we go, okay. So remember, RNA, y'all, is always made five prime to three prime, okay? So I've got this already here. Remember, RNA, if it's made five to three, it's created using this three to five template strand, right? You always look at the three prime DNA strand in order to make your RNA. So do we not agree that we just kind of did this, right? It's anti-parallel, five to three. It's complementary, right? So really the only thing that's different, y'all, between this five to three DNA strand and the RNA is we can't have any T's. So all I'm gonna do is go in here and replace these with U's. 
So your answer is the exact same with the exception that all the T's become U's because we don't have thymine in RNA. Instead, we have uracil. Are we okay with this? All right, so here's where I don't have my codon wheel available at the moment. Um, so now you would need a codon wheel, so I'm pulling mine up as I speak. Um, again, it will be provided to you on the exam. What I want you to do is go ahead and figure out how many codons do we have in our piece of RNA that we just made in number two. My computer is going on strike. There we go. Okay. All right. So remember to figure out how many codons we have. There we go. Let me make that smaller. We'll come back to this in a second. Nope. Nope. Mm. Sorry, y'all. I think this computer is just testing me today. Blackboard was too. It told me all of your stuff was graded yesterday, like every assignment for every class. And then today it was like, JK, you didn't save all your comments. So you're only three quarters of the way there. So sorry it took so long to get some of y'all's weekly assignments back. Me and Blackboard have been in a boxing match. Okay, neither here nor there at the moment. All right, so Remember, we just defined earlier a codon as a set of three nucleotides on a piece of messenger RNA. So here, oh, Nelly, that's too big, hold on. Um, let's see. So set of three, so here's one set of three. There's two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So I'm going to go ahead and answer number four. We have seven codons in our piece of messenger RNA. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use our codon wheel to figure out, well, what does AUG get us? Now, we already said it earlier, but we're going to go ahead and look at it again. You have to know how to use this codon wheel. This isn't the one that I posted for y'all, but it, it'll give us the same same information. All right. So our first codon, our start codon, is AUG. That should always be the case. So A, oh, 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 it's not letting me draw. Here we go. So A, we always start in the middle here. We have A. Now we're going to go to the U. Now we're going to go to the G. So that gives us methionine. So that's our first amino acid. Okay, our next one, C-U-A. So again, we're going to start here in the center. C to U to A gives us L-E-U. So that's going to be leucine. Now, you guys, on your own, figure out what A-G-U is going to get me. I'm going to go ahead and erase this so these lines aren't distracting. All right, y'all, what does AGU give us? A, you, good, yep, serine. And you'll only need to, on the exam, it'll only have the little three letter codes. You don't have to know what they stand for. All right, CCU is going to give us proline. Good. And then what do I have next? GUC gives us, y'all tell me. Good, valine, uh, what's next? AUC, I think we're back to that, yeah. AUC is isoleucine, and then, oops, that's I-L-E. UAA, what do I write here for UAA? This is a trick question. There you go, Jessica, you write nothing, okay? Now, on your, um, on the one I'll give you, let me see if I can pull it up don't want to eat up a bunch of our time. The one you'll get is the one that's posted in the 
the unit one assignments area, the little code on wheel. Actually, I don't remember where I put it at. But it won't say TER here. It'll have a little, um, like a square or a circle or something like that, that says it's a stop codon. Okay. And so there's no amino acid called stop. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry, throat is so scratchy. Because there's no amino acid called stop, you don't put anything here. So you're always going to have one less amino acid than you do codons, right? We had seven codons, seven sets of three, and we have six amino acids, and that's how it should be, okay? All right, number five, oh, we're going to have plenty of time, okay. What is the three-letter sequence on a tRNA called? We talked about this on our word bank. Do you all remember what this is? Good, yes. So it's called an anticodon. Because remember, codon means a set of three nucleotides. And because it's on the tRNA, it's an anticodon. So remember, y'all, this right here that we just used for this circle was our codons. Codons are found on messenger RNA. And T codons are found on tRNA. So I could ask you something like this. What will be the anticodon found on the tRNA that recognizes the third codon? Well, people always make this a lot harder than it needs to be. So the first thing you want to do, Andrew, you've done this faster than me. Ooh, you tell us <laughs> what is happening here. Okay, hold on, hold on. Let's try this again. All right, so you have to figure out first what was the third codon. So one, two, three. So our codon, third codon, was AGU, right? So now we need to know what is the anticodon that matches this. What that means is what is opposite to these three codons. Well, what does A pair with in RNA? A pairs with U. What does G always pair with? C. And U pairs with? Hey, good, Andrew. So this is your anticodon, what I'm circling right here. And the AGU was our codon. They are opposites of one another. All right, any questions about part two? I had a question about um, number four. So you said it's you'll have six proteins, but there's seven codons, correct? Yes. So you have seven amino acids. I'm sorry. Oop, let me start over again. We have seven codons. We'll have six amino acids. Because remember, this last codon right here is always the stop codon. It tells the ribosome, hey, we're done. No more. So the stop codon doesn't actually code for an amino acid. It's just letting the ribosome know that its job is done. So there will not be any amino acids associated with this last one. Okay, thank you, that makes sense. Awesome, good question. Anything else? All right, so we're gonna do, and if you do have questions, please, again, I can stick around once we're done. So please don't be shy. I know we're going through this pretty quickly. All right, so brief conversation on viruses. So I'm gonna give you just one minute, go through and read these 10 statements and mark them true or false. If you think it's false, just go like circle or underline, underline what you think is wrong. And we'll go over them together in one minute.
All right. So just like last time, here what we did last week, if you were able to go in the chat, I'm going to have you put T or F, but you're not going to push enter until I say go, because I don't want your answer impacted by anybody else. Hopefully, lots of people will be answering, so nobody really pays attention to who's saying what, okay? So for number one, a prion is a pathogen. In the chat, put T or F, but don't push enter yet, okay? I'm going to say three, two, one, go, and on the word go is when you'll push enter, okay? So everyone participate. All right, here we go. Is a prion a pathogen? True or false? Three, two, one, go. Ah, look at that. Good. All right. Ooh, we've got some, we got some uh, different answers. So remember, what is a pathogen? It's something that causes disease. So can a prion cause a disease and make you sick? It can. So this is going to be a true statement. This will be a true statement. All right. So remember, other pathogens are going to be all the types of microbes, right? A virus is a pathogen. A bacteria can be a pathogen. A helminth is a pathogen. So all the microbes that we're going to talk about can be pathogens. All right. The replication of some animal viruses is known as the lysogenic cycle. True or false? Don't push enter. Three, two, one, go. This one is false. Oh, I mean, let me show you why. Hold on. I don't know if I just zoomed in on y'all's part. The lysogenic cycle, why is it still green? Lysogenic and lytic, those are bacteriophage. Yep, so animal virus is incorrect bacteriophage are either lytic or lysogenic. All right. So we're going to talk about those in more detail in a minute. Okay, so we're going to keep going. Number three, all viruses have genetic material and an envelope. True or false? Don't push enter. Do all viruses have genetic material and an envelope? Three, two, one, go. All right, this one is false. What is the incorrect word here? Good, envelope. So y'all, anytime you see the word all, you want to read things really closely because typically in science, it, very few things are all. But what I would have, for me personally, what I was thinking when I wrote this question is the word envelope. An envelope is an accessory structure. Remember, some viruses acquire an envelope that they steal from the host plasma membrane, okay? What do all viruses have? All viruses have at least two things. What are they? And you can go ahead and push enter when you think of it. There we go, good. There we go, good. All viruses have to have some sort of nucleic acid and they all have to have a capsid. Because remember, the capsid is what's protecting that nucleic acid. Just like all living things protect their nucleic acid, okay? You don't want it just like floating around by itself. So for this statement to be true, it would have had to have said all viruses have at least genetic material and a capsid. So an envelope is one way that some viruses differ from one another. There's lots of ways they differ. Okay, number four, enveloped viruses exit the cell, but I'm sorry, exit the host cell by lysis. True or false? Three, two, one, go. Good. How do they exit? So not by lysis. What's that process called? When they push out of the host, good, budding. When the virus pushes out of the host, it steals part of that plasma membrane as it buds away. Good, budding. All right, five, an acute viral infection is one that persists for months, true or false? Three, two, one, go. Good, what is it called? It's false. 
What is it called? So we could change this. It's actually gonna be a chronic infection. Persistent infection, um, actually it can be called persistent or chronic. Normally I'll use the word chronic, but some people do say persistent. Remember an acute virus, it's not actually cute at all, which is why acute, A means without, right? So an acute viral infection is where you just wake up sick, like it just feels like you've been run over by a truck, but it clears relatively quickly. Now remember, for viruses, quickly is normally about a week and a half to two weeks, okay? So the virus comes on strong and it goes away quick. All right. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, all right, number six, all viruses have the same spike protein. True or false? At this point, just push enter. True or false? Good, that's false. Remember, the spike protein is what docks to the host. Well, all viruses have different host ranges, right? That spike protein is what determines what type of host it can infect. So that's a really big way that viruses differ, okay? It's a huge way viruses differ because that determines what host they can, they can infect. So again, when you see all, you gotta be careful. All right, seven, viruses can have an icosahedral capsid or a helical capsid, true or false? Again, push enter when you're ready. Yeah, good. These are our two main types of capsids, helical, like a slinky or icosahedral. All right, eight, a virus may contain DNA, it can have RNA, or it can have both DNA and RNA at the same time, true or false? Good, that's false. It cannot have both. It's an either or situation. Okay, so a virus can contain DNA or a virus can have RNA. It never has both. All right, number nine. I know we're right at time. Number nine, the main difference between the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle is that the lytic cycle lyses the host. That's a long sentence. True or false? Is that the big difference? Good, I thought I'd get y'all. Right, this is false because both of these cycles kill the host. Bacteriophage always kill their host. That's just how it is, okay? So remember, the big difference is that with lysogenic, they do what I call integrate and chill. Part of the viral DNA gets integrated into the host DNA where the bacteria then just replicates, having no clue that it's been infected with the virus, okay? The lytic cycle doesn't do that. It's like a wham, bam, thank you host. It gets in, it replicates, it kills the host and it moves on. There's no hanging around, okay? So that's gonna be the big difference. All right, number 10, do all viruses have the exact same replication cycle? That means it looks exactly the same for every virus. So this one is actually false. Now here's why. Now the steps would be the same, right? They attach, they enter, they uncoat, but biosynthesis looks different depending on the type of genetic material, okay? So that wasn't probably my best worded question. But the gist is trying to get at, or the question is trying to get at the diversity of, of viruses. DNA viruses, they replicate a little bit differently than RNA viruses, okay? So it's just one other way that viruses differ from one another, okay? All right, y'all, that is the end. Thank you all for attending. Um, Good luck on your exam. If you have any questions, please let me know. If you do have any additional questions for me now, please feel free um, to stick around and I am happy to answer them. But I'm going to stop.